Yeah, thanks very much everyone for joining us for the uh, Getting Started on Precision Ag hands-on workshops. Um, not very hands-on given the uh, current situation, but we the best we can do is uh, get some growers to talk about their experiences. Um, I'd like to thank GADC for funding these workshops. Um, we're doing five workshops this week and all based on different regions, which has been very good. Uh, feel free to look at those on YouTube. Uh, each one is recorded um, and um, yeah, uh, check those out from different regions. Each region's sort of got a quite a different story. So it's been been a really good experience. So um, we're also supported by FarmLink and, and SPA, the, so the Society for Precision Ag in Australia. So thanks, thanks very much for your support. Um, the format for today is um, we're going to sort of run through a bit of an intro for those people that really are, are quite new to Precision Ag, just a bit of an overall background. We're going to jump um, into uh, Fraser Bly from um, Conway Plains, who will talk about uh, some of the data we've been collecting out there and some of the decisions we've been making, uh, which is a nice segue into irrigation, uh, variable irrigation. Um, and then we'll finish off with Julian um, from the other side of the hill over at, uh, in the Burnett to give us his thoughts as well. Um, so I guess we'll start with why we're here. You know, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And we know that you know, if anyone's done yield mapping, and I've looked at thousands and thousands of yield maps over the last 20 years, and I can guarantee you that almost every single paddock's got at least 300% variability. And, and this, this field here shows a classic example of that, really even soil type, a beautiful block out near Brigolo. Um, some areas four and a half tonnes per hectare, other areas one and a half tonnes per hectare. That is totally common and uh, across the board, doesn't matter which landscape you're in. So. There's this huge underlying variability in our landscape, um, and, and it's probably fair to say anything red in this picture is probably losing money. So we're actually applying the same rate of inputs across all of those all of those hectares as well, which means we've got this huge inefficiency. And I actually did some sampling um, on, on, on an EM map we did the other day for a client out near Chinchilla, and we found that in the poor growing areas, there was there was a thousand kilograms of nitrogen per hectare available, a thousand. So a whole ton of nitrogen. So he's been over fertilizing those areas for years and, and the areas that have been growing good, good crop are around about 60 units of N, what, what you'd normally expect, right? So we've got this huge underlying inefficiencies in our systems. Um, and this can be, you know, we're getting better with our tools. We can fix these problems up, but adoption rates are still pretty low. And this hence the reason for these workshops is to actually talk about practical hands-on experience. If I start with what's not new, um, we need to solve the same agronomic problems. Nothing's really changed there, right? We've got soil constraints, we've got variable fertility in our soils. Our, our plant populations change with different soil types. We're still managing weeds, pests and diseases. And I get a lot of interest in harvest timing now about you know when do I swath my canola? Um, what's the moisture content likely to be? Because their farms have, have essentially doubled in the last 10 years, doubled in area because the number of farmers has halved. So our farms are getting bigger, which means our attention to detail is getting less because the farm size is getting so big. So we need to be more efficient with our inputs. Um, uh, we, the cost of fertilizer, as you know, has gone through the roof. And you know, uh, whilst the price of grain is good, uh, I'm sure that balance will tip out of our favour again. So we need to be, be, you know, making every acre, every acre pay, uh, and also considering the price of land at the moment is crazy. So we've got to make every acre pay. What's new? I guess the amount of data that we're getting access to is increasing. So I'll talk about satellite imagery, but every farm in Australia has had. Uh, a satellite image go over it every five days for the last five years. So that is a, a bucket load of data that's over your property right now that you can use to help you understand the variability in your systems and start managing that. And I'll go through that in detail later. We've obviously got lots of yield data now, about 75, 80% of all harvesters in Australia have a yield monitor on them. Unfortunately, only half the people with a yield monitor have actually looked at a yield map. So we've got to improve that use of this data and value it because when we don't value it, we put it at the bottom of the list and it's sort of the last thing we do and harvest gets busy. And, but we've got an opportunity here to actually in, you know, use this data to, um, to sort of increase our knowledge. Um, uh, hold on, Have you, can, can you see that? 
Uh, Christian? Yeah, we can say that. Yeah, I've just had someone comment that the they can't see uh, my screen. Maybe it's just that one person. Sorry. Um, you could try logging in and logging out again. Um, but yeah, if you can see my screen, Christian, that's that should be right, I think. Yeah, um, fine, fine with me. Okay, just try logging in and out again. Um, I guess the tools are becoming simpler to use, um, although I will have a caveat, Julian, that we, we had a bit of trouble with some of the yield mapping, the new yield mapping software you're using yesterday, but uh, hopefully they're becoming simpler and the interoperability issues are disappearing. So once upon a time, you know, two machines could not talk at all and it took sophisticated software to, to, to sort of combine those things. But now, you know, we, we output sort of a shape file which is pretty much used in all pieces of, of machines uh, or, or screens that are on the market now. And on Friday, you'll hear from um, all, all of the, um, you'll hear from all of the uh, manufacturers about how to actually get data in and out of the machines. The other thing that's changing is that connectivity. So every new machine that comes on the market now that's of reasonable size is connected to the internet. So that means we can transfer data easily, unlike in the past. So what are the key data layers that we use? Um, GPS reference soil testing is probably where you start. And I'm, I'm absolutely adamant now that the, we should never ever do any more just a blended uh, you know, sample across the paddock. So take six cores, put them into one bucket and send it off to the lab. I think that's a complete waste of time. Um, I, I know that's a pretty bold statement, but I, the more I see, the more I'm convinced that we've got to target our soil testing. And yes, you're going to spend three times as much on soil testing, but you're going to get 10 times the value because when you average all those things together, it asks more questions than it answers. And I think that's where we've been going wrong with soil testing for many years. There's been a push for grid-based soil testing, particularly in the south, southern states for lime. Not so much a big issue up here. Um, and we haven't found really good correlations when we do grid-based nitrogen sampling for variable rate. It just really hasn't worked uh, simply because nitrogen is such a, a, a changing beast with soil water, but um, there is opportunities for other nutrients as well. Um, particularly important in the north is elevation mapping, and that's either drainage planning on the flats or soil erosion on the slopes where the elevation data that's collected out of all your machines can be used for those sort of, for that planning. EM soil mapping is another layer. EM has been around for, for decades, but it hasn't been widely accessible to the Australian uh, farmer really. So we're setting about changing that. We will have a number of machines through the country. It's really good for picking up soil types, uh, particularly clay content. And you'll see on uh, Hamish's, uh, so, sorry, um, some of Fraser's work where we've got really good correlations with soil types. Um, soil depth, it, it, it does a very good job of picking up soil depth um, and where you want to look for salt and, and sodicity problems where you want to apply gypsum. Um, yesterday we had some uh, the Western Downs workshop, excellent uh, presentations there about the use of variable rate gypsum. So a really good uh, tool to manage that variability. Uh, I've talked about satellite imagery a bit, but it's really for that in-crop management plus the long-term trends because we have so much data over every farm in Australia now. Um, yield mapping, like it's been around forever, good for using for replacement of variable rate phosphate. So you can, you know, three kilograms per tonne of grain, you can put your phosphate back on just to replace what was removed, plus a little bit more if you want to. So, you know, it's a simple tool to do that. Obviously for trials and measuring your long-term performance, yield mapping pays the bills, right? All the other stuff there above that doesn't really pay the bills. So it is an important layer to actually collect uh, to prove your return on investments for different, um, you know, say you're doing a trial on nitrogen or you might do uh, deep ripping of phosphate or whatever it might be. You can actually pr prove your return on investment from doing those activities. Uh, probably a new player to the Northern region is protein mapping. A lot of guys in the South have been using protein mapping. I mean, this is a thing that's been worked on for near on 25 years and finally we're starting to see some good quality products coming out into the marketplace still relatively expensive but you can't do variable nitrogen without protein it's just not going to happen um because you've got to times your yield by your protein by your crop factor to get your nitrogen removal 
So I think it's it's going to be an important thing going forward for for ag agricultural in, in the north uh, because nitrogen is our biggest input, the biggest cost. And often we can't do much in crop management of nitrogen because the seasons just doesn't allow that. So we've got to think about other ways of dealing with that. And obviously protein mapping is good for blending. If you are chasing a protein, uh, optimal protein amount, you can blend on the run. Um, the last thing I've got there is machinery data. And now with all machines connected, we can start to see, you know, do record keeping and, and, and things like fuel use maps to understand how the machines are behaving in the field. But also importantly, it, it, it monitors what the humans have been doing. And often we see things in yield maps that are explained by what humans did at planting time. So it might have upped the speed of the, of the planting rig by a couple of gears at, at midnight because they're bored. And you could see the impact on yield maps, on the yield in the yield maps because of that. So I think, uh, you know, we totally underestimate how much impact we have on our timing and our, and our operators. And I think that, that helps to bring that to light. Um, any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we're more than happy to answer them as we go along. Um, there's a little, a little uh, type, type in box that you can, you can click on there. Just a, a bit more detail, elevation mapping. Like I said, if you've got an RTK GPS, every time you travel across the field, you're collecting elevation maps. And a lot of people don't realize that, but it's a perfect layer. Um, this is a photo from, this is a, one of the clients on Monday who talked, and this is a sort of waterlogging problem that they've got here. And this is all along this boundary, northern boundary here. You can see where the contour lines meet that boundary, basically a big swamp in there. So he's actively in there fixing that up at the moment. So it's a really good layer to start with um, because it often reflects soil type differences as well. Um, if you're on the Darling Downs, there's a lot of LIDAR being captured over you. It's, a, it's an airborne laser scanner that picks up very accurately the elevations, uh, like a one meter by one meter pixel on the ground. So it's very, very, very detailed information. And, and a lot of the Darling Dance is captured by LIDAR already. So yeah, give us a call if you want to tra track some of that down. I know a lot of growers out west are also getting LIDAR flowing over their properties for a few dollars a hectare. So uh, really good for water planning. Uh, the soil mapping that I talked about, the EM, electromagnetics, uh, is, this is one of the new machines that we've got. It, it, it actually penetrates down 1.5 meters into the soil profile. Um, it, and it's non-destructive, so that you can just drive it up and down every 20, 20 to 30 metres across your landscape, and it picks up beautifully where your different clay contents and, um, are, different salt outbreaks, etc. Actually, the picture on the bottom right is uh, just outside Toowoomba. You can see uh, clearly that the actual red areas there, um, you can see completely different soil types to the, to the stuff in the middle there. So, you know, it, it's a great tool for understanding the the basic underlying uh, soil, soil variation that you've got. And we'll go into that in detail in a minute. Uh, satellite imagery, you know, our platform delivers satellite imagery every five days to any farmer in the world for free. And in fact, we've got now got 25,000 farms using the, our platform um, to check their crops in real time. The, the, the big advantage of, of satellite data is it's actually picking up beyond our visible spectrum. So it's picking up things you can't see. And I think that's the real difference. Um, and it's, it could alert you to problems earlier than what you're actually seeing in the field. Um, this is a vegetation index called NDVI. And in this paddock, the red areas are the worst, the worst crop on that day and the blue areas are the best crop on that day. So we, we're really trying to stretch out those values. So if you are going to check that crop, then you've got a, you've got a better idea where to go. The good thing is, like I said, there's, there's five years, six years of data now. We can stack all that together. And Julian's going to talk about this is from Julian's. We'll talk about this in a minute, but a really good way of identifying where to take soil samples for those long-term issues like soil type differences, where you don't have an EM, for example. So we'll cover more on that later. Um, doing trials, this is some work. We've done a lot of work with Summit Fertilizers in Western Australia this year, where we do a zone map over five years. We convert that to three zones. And really importantly, to locate our trials. Because if you don't understand where, you, where your underlying variability is, you're gonna put the trials in the wrong place. And I see it time and time and time again, where some new fandangle company will bring a new product out, they'll put the trial strip in their most ideal location and it doesn't represent the field. So we do these zoning first, 
And then here we've put the strip trial in. You can see where the strip trial is in the remainder of the paddock. And we can separate out then the strip to the buffer. And in this, all these cases over there, they were still getting response to nitrogen as the crop was growing. So you can compare the NDVI value in the strip and the NDVI value in the buffer. And that's a really, really good way of, of, of checking uh, your trials. Um, you might want to do manure trials or um, you know gypsum or whatever it might be. You can test that out and see those responses. And obviously yields the best ultimate measure as well. Um, you know, spreading fertilizers, for example, or, or, or um, you know, applying different products. You know, you can use the satellite data, convert it into a zone map. So it's taking like a pixels and raster, like an image format and putting that into a polygon. Uh, and then you can have that in the machine in literally five minutes. And uh, some of the guys, Nathan, that talked on Monday, talked a lot about how he did, you know, ink crop uh, nitrogen this year based off satellite data was just a really simple way of, of achieving that. So you can do that very, very cost effectively. This is, uh, like I said before, there's a whole heap of machines, about two and a half thousand machines came in the country last year of reasonable size. All of those are connected, which means we can push the data from the screen, uh, from our, you know, from the zone map we create on our, wherever you create it, whatever software you want, and push that over into say my John Deere, and there it is in the screen, ready to apply. Um, and, we, and like I said, on Friday, you'll hear from all the manufacturers about how to actually do that, but that process is just becoming a lot simpler. Um, when we look at yield mapping, obviously there's a few issues with the yield mapping. We often get errors with the moisture meter or you know, blockages or um, you know, people do random driving all over the place. Uh, but you know, it is the final measure. Often we see that the satellite imagery reflects nicely in the yield data. So it is a, it is a good uh, tool to, to help with that. N not all the time, but most of the time. Um, finally, I just want to finish with protein mapping. Um, this is some stuff I just stole off the crop scanning guys. Um, yeah, feel free to have a look at their website. They've got some really good material. Um, top left is the protein map and the next one along is the yield map. And you'll see that the high protein and the low yield go together as, you, as you, you're very aware. Um, and then when you combine the two, like I said, the, it's your protein times your yield times your crop factor, gives you nitrogen removal. So you can actually get a nitrogen removal map. If you didn't have uh, protein there, you wouldn't know how much actually got removed. So it's a really important layer. If you wanna go forward, it, it, it certainly is not cheap, but um, the, the guys in down the south have certainly made those savings. So it is worthwhile to look at. So that's, um, all I had, if there's any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, Christian will be monitoring the chat. Thank you and the QA. If anyone's got any um, any questions, yeah, please fire away. Um, just gonna, while, while, while you're throwing some questions up, I'll just drop over to Fraser's. Um, just get you to unmute to phrase, share screen. Uh, right, so what, what I've done, mate, is I've just put them all into one thing and we'll just click through them and it'll zoom to each one. So yeah, give us a bit of a background, I guess, too, of where you're from and what you do and your, 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 your journey, I guess, a bit. Yeah, so, so thanks for having us. So, yeah, my name's Fraser Bly. So I, I farm with my brother, Hamish, um, and we live near Brookshead. So we've got about 1,000 acres of irrigated cropping, a um, bit of a mixture, predominantly cotton, but corn, sorghum, wheat, chickpeas, mung beans, et cetera. And we are half lateral and half flood irrigated. So I guess a, a bit of a background. Last year we got involved in a project, um, and, and it was essentially all the different sort of points of data we're capturing on the farm, trying to get better use out of that data and, and then trying to you know, sync up the data from different companies in different fashions all into the one dashboard. So a bit of a summary and then I'll let you go from there, Tim. Yeah, man, I'll just, I'll just tell me when you want me to click through, just explain, I guess, I, yeah. Yeah. So, so we just we chose one paddock last year just to concentrate on, 
Um, we chose this uh, due with we, it's a lateral centrefold lateral there. Um, got some different paddock history through it. So five years ago, we we turned it from flood into lateral. Um, so you'll see some old paddock history. And I guess one of the reasons we chose it for its variability. So as you see, the EM data, um, there's some pretty pretty heavy heavy soil and it goes up onto a ridge into some pretty light stuff. So as, as mentioned earlier, one of the things we're trying to do is sort of even out that, that yield pattern, you know, parts of the field are performing and parts aren't. So just trying to, you know, get that evenness. Well, you can see that this is your photo on the ground, mate. It's a highly topographical topography and a highly variable. Look at it. <laughs> it's it's about as even as you get, right? But it's not that even, is it? No, it's certainly, yeah, that, you know, at first glance, that it, it looks all even. And, but yeah, certainly, certainly we know there's a, there's a big variance between the different zones. So, we wanted to, to capture that. Um, the first cab off the rank was the EM survey. So, yeah, as you, as you can see there, some, some pretty significant variability. And, and sort of through the sort of three quarters of that, you can probably see the, the old, that was an old road and compaction um, yeah. right there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, that was uh, those points, I believe, were the soil testing zones. Is that correct? Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, chose chose the different points in the different zones just to do some soil testing, just to see what we're dealing with, and then I think two of those points ended up being uh, where we placed moisture probes throughout the season as well. So that country was on long fallow and and had good good moisture, so leading into the season, albeit we didn't have too much water. I'll just explain this little thing. So that just the only the thing that's really driving that map there is essentially clay content, and you can, you, you can't get a better correlation than that. So that's the EM reading on the left, which is an arbitrary reading, um, and the clay contents down there. So not a big change in clay content, not even ten percent, but the EM was sensitive enough to pick up that, and um, you know that's that's what that's basically we can now generate a clay content map from that map if we wanted to. So it, it just it just proved that that's what's driving that 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 system, that EM reading. Um, so I guess oh yeah, elevation. Yep. Um, so when we when we put the the laterals in when we developed it, um, that was all laser leveled sort of. With the with the furrow, so it certainly turned around a couple of zones, um, multi grade sort of job all over the shop, but with a, a minimum grade of 06, so I believe. Um, so, yeah. Anything else you'd like to talk to there? No, I think that just shows the, the, how how it's uh, the landscape, how you've used to you know farm it, and then. You put a lateral over the top of that, so you've got this underlying issue there too, haven't you? Really, I mean, it doesn't impact it as much now, but that, that's right. And you can probably see in those zones the old paddock history there from yeah. that elevation, and that has created some of the issues we've got. Yeah, as when we we filled in old tile drains and sort of old cuts and that sort of stuff. So that is showing up. Actually, one of the guys we talked was it Tuesday, Christian. You can see the old uh, round and round farming. What was that about 20 or 30 years ago? So, you know, those old impacts can hang around for quite a while. So I guess are we going into the NDVI? Yep. Yeah, so probably getting into the season. Um, so we would have planted cotton late October. And, and we certainly, from that first map, you can see we had some in, initial problems with establishment. So that's the, the heavier black soil. Um, yeah. really struggled to get it up it just you know we put the lateral over it we didn't have a lot of water so we weren't able to put on as much as we would have liked and baby it along but yeah and and, it, and immediately had problems um it was very raw just cracking open and lost quite a lot of plants early on um and i and i guess that that certainly had a high correlation to the em survey so I, I guess our yeah, thinking through, you know, we were expecting expecting that, and then 
as we went through the season, we were expecting that to correlate through to the yield map. Um, but as you can see, probably through the progression of that, the thin stand, the plants compensated. And then in this year, we, we, we certainly ran out of water. Um, so, you know, the, the, the thinner stand ended up yielding, you know, relatively better than you know, some of the heavier stands. And particularly as you go through to the, the yield map, I'll just jump, just quickly mention the, the other images that we year. did during the year because I, I just, let me just jump back one. So you can see what's happened here is that the NDVI, because cotton's so big, it just saturates, what we call saturation. You can see how the variability disappears and it all becomes one, right? So that's a problem with big crops. And that's like uh, corn, cotton, sorghum, I'm uh, sorry, sugar cane, uh, rice does the same problem. We have the same issues in rice. So what we did at the same time is we bought, I knew this would be a problem. So we bought some different imagery, which thing looks at things like grant, um, what we call green cover or plant cell density, two different uh, other indexes and, and they don't saturate as well. So when we got towards the end of the season, we're still able to see variability in the paddocks um, because we're just using different type of imagery, if that makes sense. Uh, I hope I've explained that well enough, but it's a different index. To, to, to not allow it to saturate. And the saturation, this is what I mean. So the NDVI goes up and plateaus out. It's just maxed out, right? It, it, it's, it's not getting any bigger or less. And typically, you know, it's 0.2 is about bare soil and, and 0.8 is as good as you're gonna get. So this crop saturated out. Now, if I just overlay the soil water, like you, you wanna explain what happened, mate? Yeah, so I'd probably, tells the story there was either rain or they were irrigation applications um, and as you'll see we were only able to give it a couple so you know by mid-January we were sort of the race was over for us so the, the crop certainly looked quite good there it did, did have plenty of potential but uh, just didn't have the water to follow it up with. Yeah you're waiting for this big Lanina to come mate. That, uh, the, the most that, promised that, Lanina. Well it's still coming Lanina. apparently it's coming it's again they tell me. Um, so yeah, look, we had good, we had good profile. Um, we definitely took a bit of a punt on on some crop, and yeah, particularly this field, it just we we yeah took water to other fields and concentrated on that, and yeah, unfortunately, weren't able to give it what we wanted. Um, so I'll just jump over to the PCD, which is a different index, right? And we'll put the same map over it, and you can see the PCD drops when the soil water runs out because we've run out of irrigation water. So, you know, different indexes will pick up these factors differently. And you just need to keep that in mind for the crop that you're actually growing. In, in most parts, NDVI is fine, right? It, it, for broadacre cropping, it's, it's absolutely perfect. But these big biomass crops like cotton do need a little bit more tweaking. But it, it shows that, you know, you can detect the stress changes in the imagery at the same time as you're getting the stress in the paddock. Um, the red line there for anyone that doesn't know is the refill point. Uh, the, well, the, the hopeful refill point. Uh, um, yeah, it doesn't always work like that. Uh, yield map? Yeah, I guess, yeah, taking it through to yield, um, you know, I guess our thinking was, you know, to, to correct some of this variability, we were looking at, you know, the possibility of having a variable rate application of manure. So we got through to the season and then we we're expecting to see that correlation to those, you know, EM surveys and early soil, like early sort of NVDI zones, particularly where we'd struggle. I think what the yield map certainly indicated, and you can probably see the line through the middle there, that was like where the final pass, uh, yeah, just this, there. Just and, here where it stopped? Yeah, just there. Yeah, that's where the, that's where the machine on its last 30 mils that we're giving it. <laughs> oh, so it dear. certainly told us that, as it got to the sort of the top of that ridge there, um, you know, the lighter soil ran out of moisture sooner. Um, so it was pretty telling. So I guess in, in making a variable rate application map, the yield map probably wasn't going to tell us that much because what we were trying to fix with the, the heavy soil zones um, that we had problems with plant establishment early on. So I guess that was the progression that we went through in, in designing the next sort of variable rate map. Um, and I guess, you know, the benefit of having all this information is we were, we were able to, to bring it up and, and look at each individual maps and the progression as it went through the season. 
So that sort of told the story for us. And then, yeah, as I say, we, we were looking to apply uh, chicken manure. And I guess our thinking was we wanted to, to really trial a significant rate whilst doing the whole paddock and, and see if we could ramp up those zones. So I think, I think we ended up, you know, in the, in the basically five ton across all the yellow, and then we we're up to 13 ton or I think it was 13 to 15 ton in those variable rate zones. So that was, that was the plan there. That was the plan, mate. What actually happened? Well, it's uh, <laughs> the Larnina did turn up. And so after picking, it was incredibly wet. So we, we had real problems, pupae busting and the like, and then getting that. So we're trying to turn that cotton field round into wheat. Um, and then we had a contractor spreader to do the manure. And due to machinery breakdown, lack of time and every, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we, we weren't able to execute that, that variable rate plan. And we just ended up with a blanket rate sort of application. So yeah, sadly, we haven't been able to put into practice what we're hoping, but yeah, that's the nature of it. That's the reality of, of the world, man. And it happens time and time again, you know, like something will let us down right at the last minute. And it's like all that energy felt like a bit, you know, like it was a bit of a waste. But I think um, that's the reality of farming and that's the reality of, you know, where we're at in the industry. And, and we need more of like the contractors are a classic example, you know, to, to come on the journey with us. Uh, with this whole thing, like farmers and, and agronomists and, and precision ag people, it's all got to happen together. Otherwise, you know, one link, weak link in the chain and all the energy has been wasted. So uh, we see it time and time again. Uh, Christian, you want to make any comments on that too? I need to reinforce the fact that, yeah, everyone's got to be on the same page, I suppose, and, and on the same journey in terms of adoption. And that includes you know, collection of data with the contractors and the growers through to, you know, the driving of, of that information, the use of that information by the agronomists and all the rest of it. You find that, you know, you might have growers that are keen, but the agronomists are kind of dragging their heels a bit in terms of wanting to identify issues through the use of data. And it's and it kind of slows the slows everyone's progress and the momentum down. So yeah, I mean, every, everyone's got to be on it together to, to really get the most out of it, I think. Yeah. And I guess I'll just jump in there. That was, you know, part of the project was looking at uh, different companies sharing data and I guess all working together in the same goal. So we had multiple different points of data capture and, and it was really important that we were all on the same page and utilising all the different points to, to get to that end plan. And, and I, I would, you know, back that up, that it is, it is you know, at, that was our first look at it, at it all. So it was, it was pretty complicated to get your head around all the different sort of platforms and data points and, and similarly to get, as you say, the agronomists and everyone else on the same page. I can see that's, that's going to take work over time. So we're all sort of building our knowledge together. So we're all speaking the same language, if you will. Um, before we jump onto the the pear tree dashboard stuff, tell us what you what what's happening now. I guess this is yeah, this is this is almost live uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, so I ago. guess yeah. As, as an extension, you know, we just concentrated on the one paddock, the one lateral paddock there. Um, so we've certainly seen enough value out of doing that that we wanted to extend that through, uh, particularly the rest of our lateral. Um, lateral irrigators so we've, we've, we've gone and we'll pretty much repeat the process over a larger area so this is three different laterals um em surveyed and i guess you can really see well the old paddock history a lot of the old compaction you can see the flood fields in there clear as day and then you'll see the variability in the soil so i, I guess intuitively always soil zones that we knew we always need our lighter and heavier and and, and i guess it really is just that visual representation. I guess over time, you know, we could overlay yield data over that and it'd show up once again, clear as day. And in different seasons, different crops, the different zones will show up. So, yeah, I think it's really okay. helpful. Sorry. I was gonna ask, so that paddock on the left, what typically happens there with that red, in that red area is at a um, lower 
lower clay content, lower yielding area, or depends on the season and the crop? Depends on the season and the crop. I'd say lighter, it's a sort of a, we call it a lighter chocolatey brown soil. Um, great for establishing cotton, always gets away a day or two earlier, you know, jumps out of the ground quickly, streaks ahead, but then, yeah, if it runs out of moisture, it'll go off quicker. And then as you go sort of further above it into some of our heavier stuff, really difficult to establish, but, um, you know, in years when we've had sort of grain or cereals in there and sort of run out of moisture, it, it really holds on and performs magnificently. So just a, a quick exp explanation on, on the EM numbers, the higher the number, it's either the higher clay content, higher moisture or higher salt. And that's why you need to do soil sampling to detangle that. And that we know these soils are non-saline in, in, in the most parts. So it's really determining clay content or moisture content. So I think some of these impacts like the little blue dot there is probably moisture related as well. So you've got to you've got to actually detangle these maps to actually make sense of them. You can't just necessarily take it on face value. Um, sometimes you can, but most times you need to to, to understand what those numbers mean because they're just an arbitrary number, really. Um, could that that be the channel going through the center, Tim? Oh, it could um, be a, yeah, a bit of channel leakage or something. Yeah, that, that might have had water in it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yep. So just all those, 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 anything that's more conductive will increase the readings, including Telstra lines and uh, <laughs> buried old metal pipes show up really well, mate. Uh, uh, sheep dips show up really well where they brought salty water to the service and, and, you know, 50 years ago they were feeding sheep. So you get all those sort of little impacts coming out that you yeah, didn't really know you had. All right, we're just... Just a segue now, mate, can you just, I'm just gonna segue into pear tree because we picked pear tree. Uh, oh, you, you explain how we, what, what you, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll explain how we got to pear tree. Pear tree is a company we, we work with, uh, they're based in New South Wales. It's a dashboard for all the dashboards, if you like. So all the data that's, that like you've got 15, or we had six different companies working on this project, six different ag tech companies. And Hamish from Pear Tree said, we'll just bring them all into one dashboard so that Fraser's got one login point. You can see all of his data that's being collected. So I just want to give a bit of the background of the project. It was funded by uh, Queensland Government, uh, DAF. So thanks to DAF for, for funding that uh, as a showcase, I guess. And uh, I appreciate uh, Fraser's been uh, showing his farm to the world. So I appreciate that. So I'll just segue into that, mate. Yeah, so I guess... Um... You know, as I guess the original challenge came up is that I think we're all adopting techno technology at different rates from different companies. So the general progression of something, you, you grab it from for one year and then, then as you build on something, you go to another company and another company. So, you know, the question was asked, is there a place where we can bring it all back into a central dashboard? So I guess that's that's how the project sort of came out. And then, and then sort of, then we've gone with Pear Tree and then I guess all the data we got from different companies is coming back to the central dashboard. So I guess what we're looking at here is Oops. the sort of uh, the mapping component of that. I uh, can't quite read what it is, but- Yeah, it's the EM and um, yield, mate. That'll that be one. EM survey overlaid by yield data. Yep. So I guess that, that became a really useful tool to quickly swap between maps. And then on, on this, you'd see on your left, you can you can have sort of six or seven different bits of da you know, data or mapping that you want to look at, and then you'll alternate between the two, and then you've got the slide to go either eye. So you can really get a, a, a desktop view of what's going on, and, and you sort of do it throughout the season. And then similarly, you know, overlay the moisture data as you did before from the, uh, the, the Goanna probe. And then I guess integrating, uh, well, this is all your weather data, um, Windy, you'll see the spray data, and then you'll go into. I guess the, the thinking was just get as much as we spray. could and put it all in there, and then sort of try and make sense of it. So that's that's obviously sort of spray forecasting to you know for any sort of prediction you want to go out and spray, etc. Um, we put in the oh, that's our dam level monitor, so a live feed of what sort of what's happening in the in the dam, and that. That gives us sort of our water usage over the crops. Also, 
linked in with evaporation and seepage data, which is which has been pretty useful. Uh, and that's also, the, that's the final uh, river data as well. Yeah, that's the river flow data. So all the gauging stations above us. So I guess just giving us a live view of water flows so that we'd, we'd be you know, ready to go if uh, if the water level heights were triggered and we, were, we had an ability to water harvest. So. Yeah, I, I guess certainly for us, we, we felt like that's, that's where the data is going to end up and you can have a, a good overview of everything when you're pulling all the different levels of things and bringing it back into that point. Feel free to throw questions up um, on uh, any of that. That's excellent, mate. Well, um, yeah, we'll field any questions as they come through, but nothing yet. So, um, yeah, really appreciate you sharing your experiences with everyone um, and, 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 you know, showing the actual data from your paddocks to the world. Um, yeah, not every farmer... Um, He's happy to do that, but it's, it's, it's great that you're done. It's, um, it certainly wasn't pretty that, uh, you know, it was a bit disappointing that the particular field we chose, we really didn't have enough water to make it go. But yeah, it still gave us data. And, you know, I think we still took plenty out of the project. And um, I guess it's, uh, yeah, really opened our eyes that this is sort of where we're all heading and we need to start, you know, really learning the language and getting our heads around it so that we can utilise all the, all the good data that's out there. Couple of questions. One is who were the six ag tech companies? So we had, let me get it right, mate. There was us, Pear Tree, Yabby, Big Sky, I guess uh, the Vanderfield guys. That's five. Who else am I missing? Goanna. And Goanna, there's the six. Yep, thank you. Um, and another question where is the dashboard available from? So Pear Tree. What's the website again, mate? Pear Tree Dot Intelligence, I think, is his website. Anyway, you just just search up Pear Tree Dashboard and you'll find it. Uh, Hamish Munro is his name. He's designed this. He's a farmer in New South Wales. Um, so yeah, go and have a go and check out that. Cool. I think that's all of our questions. I'll I'll just stop that sharing. Um, Okay, another question came through. Can you talk about um, how you chose the, the, the tech that was in the dashboard? I think we chose it for you, mate, didn't we? <laughs> Pretty much. I, it, was, it was certainly all centred around water and water management. Um, and then I guess, yeah, look, looking into the variability of our yield. So it was a bit of a, I think it was whoever, yeah, I don't how did that process go? Now I'm trying oh, to it was me, mate, pretty well. I just <laughs> said these are, these are some good companies. We'll give them a crack together. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it was who was keen and who was open to the idea of sharing and, and sort of all getting on the same page. So, yeah, that was that was a certain challenge of the project. So Yeah, we wanted sort of legitimate um, good ag tech businesses that could work together, you know, that's uh, ones that were willing and open to share and, 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 have, and had... Complementary, not competing products, I guess, is the key thing there. So to fill in all the bits and pieces and put them all into one spot. And, and I guess I would say that one thing we, we learned through the project, that each individual company has you know, invested a lot of time and energy into their own dashboards and their own products. And I don't think you can beat that. So what it is, is taking bits out of that that then comes in and allows you to have that overview. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't try and, you know, it's not competing that, you're not taking it from one and you know, putting it all in the one spot, I guess. It's utilising bits of it that make sense all together. Thank you. Thanks, mate. I'll let you get on with watering and um, spraying and planting and harvesting and everything that we do at this time of crazy year uh, on the Darling Downs. Um, thanks, well, mate. And I'll, thanks. I'll jump over to... Jump thanks over very much. To, and, uh, yeah, cheers. Thanks I'll jump much. over to Crafty... Um, Mate, uh, are you right no to share screens? Yes. Yep. Uh, the other question that's just come in: the data, did the data come from APIs? Um, yes, where possible, we've API'd data between them. Uh, it, in the early stages, it's it's still a bit manual, but um, yes, the ultimate aim here is that everyone has APIs. And if for those that don't know what APIs are, it's sort of computer to computer speak. 
so that data can flow seamlessly between pieces of software without any humans being involved. Um, and, and I think that it's not the future, it's right now. Everyone is building APIs to share data. And um, I'm sure you'll talk about some of that stuff too, mate. I think there's probably a bit of work been going on what you're doing. So um, yeah, nice to have you on board. And um, no worries. thanks for, for spending some time to talk to us. No worries at all. Um, so yeah, I'll, um... So you can see my screen there, can you? Yes, I can see it, mate. Uh, can everyone, everyone else see that? Yep. Radio. Just minimise that, and we're good to go. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to do a summary of irrigation precision ag technology and our offering. So uh, my name's James Craft. I work for for Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay builds uh, zomatic pivots. And uh, we also have this product, FieldNet. So, <clears throat> what is uh, what is FieldNet? I'll start there. So, FieldNet is um, is our basic link for the the pivot to the user. So it's our software platform. Um, like we're talking about dashboards and everything like that. It's um, really evolved over time from simple. Um, uh, turn on and off a pivot to uh, analysis and everything else. So uh, FieldNet can go on, it can be retrofitted to any uh, machine. Uh, we're looking at uh, being the, the water management system, I guess, for, uh, for a farm. We've also incorporated um, some agronomy tools over time. I think uh, that's evolved. Uh, Having those agronomy tools there for decisions about your uh, irrigation is important. I do want to stress if anyone wants to jump in for a, um, a question, do it at any time. I'm quite happy to pull up and answer questions. So, with a, I'll just do a summary of all the different platforms. I guess uh, you can you could say that uh, all customers have different are at different steps on their on their PA journey. Um, and you could break these down into five easy, um, easy levels, I think. Um, different businesses have different needs. So some businesses might only wanna connect and monitor equipment, um, see what's happening on farm. Others wanna control it. Uh, then you move on forward into analyzing what data you, you, that you have out of those machines uh, then really it's the next step, which is um, most people have stopped at that analyze um, step. It's really the next step, which is that that um, uh, they call precision to decision, decision step, where you're actually actioning uh, on that data and, and then also reviewing at the end of the season uh, to make some decisions on future operations. So with, um, with our Connect, um, with connecting with FieldNet, uh, base, it's that first step of PA. It's um, the simplistic, it's in your pocket. Um, and what you wanna do, you wanna understand what's happening across your business. So is a machine going? Uh, what's the pressure? Um, I want my team and myself to be alerted if anything happens. Um, I might have a manager who uh, doesn't want to go into apps or all the complexity and they just want a simple text message to say that something's happening. Um, or I might have um, a staff member who's all up with it and wants to know exactly what's happening with the soil moisture um, and go through the app and really analyze what's happening on farm. So the important thing is having that connection and that's really the first step. Uh, to provide this across all, all pivots, uh, We've brought out this low cost um, uh, pivot watch. It's quite a handy little unit and just uh, bolts on a, any machine. We've had um, customers put it on hard hoses as well, just to see whether they're stopping and where they're at position wise. Um, so yeah, it's looking uh, pretty promising. Control, so the next step moving along would be uh, being able to remotely control all irrigation equipment on the farm. So as a farm evolves over time, so does the technology. So the first pivot might have gone in 10 years ago. Um, as the business evolved, um, there was enough money for investment to put a couple more pivots in. 
these being new pivots, they came with FieldNet and all the uh, infrastructure needed. And you might want to upgrade an uh, older system uh, with a pivot control to get it on, on, on the uh, dashboard. The important thing is that they all look the same and uh, you can do similar tasks with them. So controlling um, the system through advanced plans, setting by time and date, sectional VRI, uh, basically looking at um, uh, being able to water in different pie sections, uh, or you could be looking at controlling the machine uh, and only watering on off-peak hour times. Uh, so people may look at that as um, uh, precision ag. The analysis is, as we talked about, is getting that data out and putting it in easy to use formats so that you can see what's happening. So this would be a situation where you're back in the office, uh, maybe weekly, maybe monthly, looking at your water usage, um, trying to keep up to date with what's happening. And um, you can generate uh, water over time. Uh, can you see my mouse there? I'm not quite sure. I need a pointer. Yeah, mate, I can see. Yeah, it. okay. So yeah, you can uh, monitor that over time, uh, look at when the water's gone on or, or not. And um, also you can create a, um, <clears throat> a sectional map of different, different areas. So in light of this, um, a lot of people looked at the at FieldNet as a way to look at the water, where really the end game's a crop under the under the pivot, isn't it? So really we wanted to incorporate some information to do with um, the crop growth and, um, and the environment. So we've actually set up this water trend, which just comes free with every field net. Um, so what it is, it gives you a seven day um, crop water usage, uh, gives you a prediction of the rainfall. And um, by just simply looking at that on the, on, on field net on the phone, you can say radio, uh, this uh, say corn crop or wheat crop is gonna have 30 mils of evaporation over the next seven days, and I'm only expecting seven mils of rain. Um, therefore, I've got to top it up with uh, 27 mils over a week to keep the same soil moisture profile. Um, this, of course, changes over the crop's uh, uh, maturity. Um, so therefore, as the crop grows, say you're going into peak flower, um, it'll actually ramp up that uh, crop water usage and that can be set through the crop stage. So at any time, if the crop stage is out or whether you just need a fine adjustment um, to make sure you're getting the right amount of water, um, you can change that. So that's something that previously was an add-on, but um, uh, the uptake of it's been quite good. And um, it's just something that comes with uh, water trend. Uh, we'll Rafi, can I ask a, a question? Yeah. Um, the forecast of precipitation, is that just from the local bomb? Or yeah, well, it, it, it's from those five kilometre grid networks uh, interpolated um, data. So basically, when you're looking at any of those um, weather platforms or any uh, precision ag platform, they're using a similar data set. So yeah. it's uh, all of that um, correlated data that takes into account the GPS location of the pivot. So yeah. it's the five kilometre grid data, um, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's quite good. But, you know, you and I know you could be standing in one pivot and it's raining and the other pivot's not. So uh, really it's important to um, obviously take into account actual rainfall. That's, that's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw another spanner in the works there too. The, the, there's also a really a fairly straightforward calculation um, to work out crop water use from NDVI. So yep. it's a user NDVI times a, a simple formula that was developed um, uh, by John Hornbuckle in CSIRO. And yep. that will give you the KC values, which you could just put straight into this probably. Um, yep. The other option is that you can take it to the full step and like Goanna Ag have done, they use that as full, that 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 NDVI times you by, by ET, ETO to get your ETC, so your crop actual water use. That's all based on satellite data. So there is some really good work going on in that space to actually really finally predict uh, crop water use based on satellite imagery as well, which might give you some more spatial information. Anyway, I just yeah, thought, sure. I, thought I'd mention that, and that's what Gwenna have been doing. They cross-checked their soil moisture probes 
with the, with what the crop water use says and balance it out. So, yeah, some really good work there that's been done and, and, and available to irrigators. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely go into it um, uh, in the next step with our field net advisor, which does use that that um, correction okay. um, from cool. satellite. Yeah, mm. so it's good. Um, so with the crop models, there's um, there's over 30 crop models in there at the moment. So wheat, cotton, sorghum, maize, hemp, pasture. Um, basically, whatever we can, um, whatever is in the ground. If there's something not there, it's probably an unusual crop, but um, not saying it's um, something we could test or have a look at. For example, uh, in Tasmania, we use the canola um, crop model. It worked really well on the poppies, um, which was um, quite good. Yep. So they're the first three steps, and then um, most people then end there. So most users stop at that point, and then it's the end, and then what? Um, so it's the action. So it is key. Um, there's two different paths you could you could go here, and I'm going to go through two, which is a hardware solution or a or a software solution. So the first um, hardware solution is uh, variable rate irrigation. Um, uh, people uh, look at variable rate irrigation and think it's something brand new but it's technology that's evolved over 15 years through our team in um, New Zealand. Uh, originally it was developed to in dairy to keep water off the races, to um, stop stones getting in the feet, hoofs of um, uh, cows and um, really keep the, um, the health of the cow in the dairy farm at uh, an optimum level. Uh, but now we're seeing that the VRI has got a place in most farming systems uh, with a strong uptake in Tasmania and down the Mallee. So how the system works is um, it's got this daisy chain of nodes out along the pivot and uh, each one of these nodes individually controls four sprinklers. Um, they know exactly where they are in the field and therefore it's, um, it's polygon based watering. So you could set up these um, these maps and they could be as complex or as simple as um, you would like. And um, you can then adjust the maps at any time uh, to give you different watering applications in different zones. So here we can see um, a simple um, zoned map, uh, which would have been um, something uh, on that lateral uh, of phrases. It could have been something set up there uh, where you could actually target those, those uh, that poor area of establishment and really put more water on there to try and keep it going so it was there, um, so it got away. It can be more complex. Here's a, a system in, um, in Tassie and you can see the creek running through the middle, the different EMs and even down to putting the wheel tracks in in those clay areas so that you can stop watering um, in those clay where the wheel tracks cause us some problems. Um, and um, really turn the water off there and and try and maintain the um, the wheel tracks as well. And we, we're doing some stuff in, in Tassie, mate, where um, just taking the just the, the image in the crop as well, like EM's a really yep. good layer. But, yep. you know, also just taking the image in the crop and the areas that were saturated were low NDVI. And we're just winding back to water rates on those and upping water rates in the areas that were growing really actively to try yep. and even up that crop. And that's what exactly what happened. So yep. yeah, um, there's some really good growers down there that have really embraced this technology now. And, yeah, that's right. You know, we can use simple layers, just like your vegetation index. That's basically yep. free. So you know, you could pump that out straight into this and, and yeah, exactly. Have a map going straight away. Yeah, that's right. So an example was um, uh, had an AM layer from a, a, a potato um, crop. Um, you basically got an elevation uh, from the John Deere machine and um, you could tell that the sandy ridges and the, the clay hollows definitely showed up nearly exactly the same as the EM. So really that cheap layer of a, uh, elevation map straight out of your John Deere planter um, is, um, yeah, could have um, been a lot cheaper than the EM, but, but um, you yeah, know, EM's more accurate, but as an indicator, mm. it's a very cheap layer to get. Sure. Um, elevation layer. Murphy, how so, many um, rates will that support? How many, how many rates? Mm. Um, it can be as complex as you want. Um, so, for example, with which I'll get in the field net advisor, it'll give you. It could give you polygons down to uh, five meters and um, be 
changing different rates based on the GPS location. Like the more complex the map is, um, obviously the more processing power is needed. Um, but um, but yeah, this this map, for example, in that corner is you would say highly complex. Um, and but that's a breeze for BRI. Yeah. Um, again, here's one in <clears throat> an example in um, in New Zealand where they've just overlaid the, the wheel tracks so you can actually just turn off the wheel tracks so that um, you can maintain them if you ha happen to get a you need to water when it's wet or you're starting to get an issue with um, with bogging uh, you can just turn off those areas and um, yeah really um, make a difference in um, being able to get water on when you need it. So with the, the with the uptake, <clears throat> there is a demo site. So if anyone wants to uh, have a look at it, I'm more than willing to show them through it. Just uh, let me know afterwards. Um, so with the uptake in Tassie and in the Mallee and the expected uptake um, all over Australia, we're, we're soon to build, in, uh, build these systems in Toowoomba. So, we're going to be uh, putting them together. Previously, they were put together in um, New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, with the uptake, um, we're moving the, the assembly over here. And yeah, it'll be good to have that right um, on the doorstep to go have a look at. So, I think most people might be familiar with the Smarter Irrigation for Profit program. Um, the first program ran in, um, in Tassie. And it was good because they used uh, one of our systems um, to do the evaluation. And I was basically talking about the payoff time for a VRI system. So initially when it was um, promoted, we were talking about water savings. Um, and when you, when you just do that uh, calculation itself, remembering that back then the water cost assumption was $70 a meg. Um, I know that's probably uh, well and truly up over that by now, but um, the water, using the water saving calculation, it was used to pay back was nine years. So convincing someone to invest in something that was gonna take nine years to pay back is, is quite hard. But when you looked at the improved production, so in this case, it was um, tons of dry matter per hectare, uh, the payback was in three years, but when you combine them both together, it's less than two years. So we've found that people um, who have bought the VRI system uh, it's really the increase in yield in those low spots or the areas where they can water um, more effectively to get the yield that they want. Uh, that's really the, the increase um, in profitability that they find. And, um, you know, putting it in and getting it paid off in less than two years is probably a fantastic situation. Um, the infrastructure cost obviously is reduced by hectare over large areas. So, for example, would suit a lateral ir irrigator down the ground. And uh, the important part is getting that water where it's needed. And um, also that wheel track management um, has been um, some of the benefit that people are seeing. So Crafty, do you find that, is it a bit like variable rate in Uri, for example, where you're not necessarily using uh, a lesser amount, you're just putting it in the the spot where it's going to get utilised is a bit the same with February irrigation, but the water usage is the same. And so it's not not a um, the benefit with the system. It's just just like an exact supply. It just pulses wherever you want the water to go. So you can change it up as you want. So, for example, if it was a situation where you had um, cotton not growing uh, or cotton struggling to get established, well, you could just highlight those areas and and put the water on there. Um, or if it was an issue where you wanted to um, fertigate, for example, through the pivot, and um, you wanted to put different rates of nitrogen out, well, you could do that by just creating that different map. So it's all about whatever you want to do, um, it will do it, yeah, with the, with the different zones. So, um, We've got a calculator online, so just Google the uh, Zomatic Precision VRI calculator. And um, what it does there, it gives you, um, it's got different formulas. You put in your area, uh, put in your zones that you want to not water or water less. Um, and it'll give you a calculation of the payoff of the system for the size of your pivot or your lateral. 
um, say it's not a guessing game, you can go in and, and do that. So I'll quickly go through the software side. So we talked about a hardware solution and I'll quickly go through a, a software solution. So any pivot connected to BuildNet um, can have BuildNet Advisor put on it. So what we're doing here is we're, we're putting the, a soil map into the system. We're overlaying that with the, um, the, crop, uh, the crop data, uh, the water applied, and then the environmental conditions in which we're growing it. So FieldNet Advisor combines all of those and gives us a representation of a soil water balance, or it gives us um, across a whole field, it gives us a um, prediction of where our soil moisture is sitting. Um, so similar to a soil probe, um, we've got our permanent wilting point here, we've got our um, stress line, and then the yellow is our refill point. What the system does, it goes through and assesses uh, where the water's up to. Um, this is an example up at, up uh, on the downs up there um, of some spring wheat that went in, and you can see there's been um, uh, three wa three watering events, uh, which has ticked the moisture uh, back up to optimum, and then over time, uh, from mm -hmm. the 25th of August, we've got the water ticking down, this, uh, available water ticking down, one very tiny. Um, uh, rain event and then it's giving us a prediction out to September 24th of when we need to water. So in this case um, you can actually set that trigger point higher and it'll actually give you an indication of how much water you're going to use forward and when and what day to use it. And the way it does this is because it's using the, the crop growth model in the background. So we can see here um, here's our crop water uses, usage that we actually have observed over time. So this is up until the um, September the 14th. And uh, you can see that um, uh, obviously coming into flowering, um, we've, got, we've got a higher crop water usage. And then we've got this prediction of 15 days. Um, so around September the 22nd, it's saying that we're going to have a hot uh, uh, either Oh, well, a hotter or warmer uh, week with a combination of flowering at peak water usage. And therefore we're gonna max out at um, nine millimeters a day in that crop. And then you can see there's a 30 day, um, sorry, a 30 year um, forecast. These 15 days, um, they move along obviously every day um, so that it keeps ahead of it. And this is what the system uses to predict where you need to water and when. So that comes through, uh, you can view it on the phone. It'll give you these zones. So in this case, um, it looks like a sandy ridge. This isn't the Dolby crop, this is a, an example. Um, in this case, it's a sandy ridge through the middle where, where the water is, um, soil moisture is, is uh, the bucket smaller um, compared to this other area. And it's telling you that that um, area is um, lacking. Uh, it'll give you the recommendation. Uh, you could look at a, uh, the soil uh, irrigation schedule over time um, throughout the season. Uh, the weather, uh, we're using the weather to calculate, why not put it on the phone? <laughs> it's a simple um, thing we could do, just put it on there and uh, look at the hourly, the daily forecast, and um, also the, the reference ET. And you can also um, change the, the crop growth um, stage in field, say you walk in field and it's saying it's two leaf, but it's really three, you can then change that up. So yeah, come back to Tim to the, to the adjustment via um, satellite. So with FieldNet Advisor, this example's in New Zealand, there's actually six different crops under this one pivot um, over here. And uh, so we've got uh, potatoes, corn and oats. Um, so uh, what we're doing here is um, keeping a check on the, on the crop growth stage with EVI as per each of those um, crop zones. So basically the, the satellite imagery will give you an indication that um, I'm suggesting that this canola, for example, is just about to flower. That's a pretty simple one to pick up. Um, and you can then adjust the crop um, via that indication from the, from the satellite imagery. But the important thing is the auto generation of the water map. So 
what happens with the VRI system is uh, Field Net Advisor will actually pump punch out a recommenda uh, recommendation on how much water you need to put in what zone. And then up in this top corner up here, um, on a normal pivot system, you would see the recommendation as a, um, just as a sector uh, VRI, so that the machine will speed up and slow down in those different areas. So going through, the next stage would be maybe uh, a review. Uh, so if someone wants to look at all the data on hand, so they've gone through, they've gone through the analyze, they've gone through the action, then they wanna see what result I've had. And, and this is a result from um, last season uh, with an example on some potatoes down south, uh, basically assessing the water savings that they got, the 13% water savings with um, our field net advisor, um, the power savings, they could have watered four, four days uh, less watering and having more efficient um, uh, water use over that, or power use over the fields is uh, quite significant. Um, the assessment of the yield, so due to the variety that was chosen, um, there was 20 days where the crop was in stress where we couldn't keep the water up, but choosing a different variety may have uh, fixed that. So right through to doing a cost benefit analysis of having some BRI, so being able to put water where you'll need it at the right time um, was important. And then obviously moving forward with a plan to move to VRI, converting that additional income into more efficient systems and, and generating uh, more income for more investment. So that was uh, the PA journey through FieldNet. Um, yeah. Obviously there's all different levels where people can jump in there and and um, or that people are using FieldNet for. So um, yeah, just a bit of a summary and um, hope I've covered it um, quite well, but happy to uh, answer any questions if there were any. Yeah, so throw some questions in the Q&A or the chat and um, James would be happy to answer those. I think that was a great summary, mate. And it, I think the journey is the right word. And uh, it's a word I use a lot now is that where every, every farm is on a different part of that journey and um, it's good to be able to enter at different points because people might be ready for certain things. So I think that was excellent, mate. No worries. Um, yeah, keep firing the questions through if you get them as you think of them, um, we can pull them up at any time. Um, let me just, now leaving the best to last. <laughs> uh, I'll flip over to, to um, where am I? I'll just get this going, sorry. Share screens for you, Julian. Right, has that, has that come up there? Can you see that, Christian, yeah, all right? We can, we can see those stacks, yep. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to introduce Julian Cross from over Cumbia Way. Julian, do you want to give us a bit of a back? Well, a bit of an overview of your, your place and uh, a bit of your history, and then I'll, we can step through the maps as we as we go. I'll just have to turn you off mute. Um, just have to unmute yourself there, mate. Try that. There we go. How's that? Yep, gotcha. Yep, yeah, all dry land farming over here. Uh, about yeah, 400 hectares. Um, concentrate mostly peanuts, maize, wheat, winter, yeah, winter crop, bit of oats, mostly wheat. Um, yeah, and emphasise the word dry for the last three years. Very to the point <laughs> where I haven't for a couple of years. Just been oh, by the time the rains came, it's been too late to plant them. Basically, so been concentrating more on the winter crop and late planted mung beans and a bit of maize. Um, got into, started playing around with the, um, I'll go back, I suppose. We got uh, the RTK back in 2008 with the old B line. And then 2016, we progressed up to the Topcon, which got us into our variable rates and section control and all the good things that come with the more modern um, setups. And that progressed forward 2018, <laughs> started the real 
head bender with the yield, the yield monitoring um, and variable amounts of success. They change, change um, software versions and then you can't calibrate it and all this sort of caper. And the original, the original package for um, actually viewing our yield mapping was a complete dud. So they brought out another one last year and well, that's not much better at the moment, but they're working on that one. And then um, got involved with Tim with the satellite data imagery. And um, last year we did our first variable rate fertilizer runs, um, which you can see there on that one map there where Tim marked out the, the good, the bad and the ugly for soil testing purposes. And um, we planted that crop of corn back at Christmas time on that on that variable rate system. And um, I'd say it's, yeah, beginning of a good run, I'd say it's something definitely, something to look forward to as Tim in his introduction, you know, there was areas there where there's a bulk amount of surplus nitrogen. We had exactly the same thing. In the really poor areas, we were pouring the fertilizer on on a blanket coverage. And with the soil testing came up, no, no, you've got you've got um, you've got an abundance of nitrogen in those areas. So yeah, we've been just pouring fertilizer on for no gain, which was um, something that really attracted me. And this country here, like that one, that 33 hectare field there, it's 1.2 kilometers long, I think roughly, probably four different soil types. Across the crown of the hill, it wasn't contoured till the 70s, and we're talking, you know, three to five degree slope. So a lot of old erosion, very poor country now. So then that's that between that and the, and the variable soil types we've got some very shallow, some with good depth, good water holding capacity. It's just ideal, ideal setup for the variable rate and we'll continue to do so. Thanks, Tim, yeah. Yeah, so what we did first up was just, of course, the yield data dilemmas. Um, we, we thought, well, let's just jump to the satellite data. It's all available. And we stacked the five years together. Um, uh, obviously in that time, you had a fair old dry spell. So we, we picked whatever winter and summer we could. And this is a learning that we found across the north, actually, is that if you're going to look at zoning up and you're going into summer crop, then you should look at all your old summer crop, uh, pardon me, years to, to combine because the responses we're getting in summer crop are different to winter crop. And this is clearly shown here. So when we stacked all the winter crops together, the zones were a bit different to what we did when we stacked all the summer crops together. And as you were going into summer crop, we naturally picked that to, to work on. Um, so that's an important lesson in the north that you do not see anywhere south of Dubbo. So it's a, it's a northern, northern region cropping issue. And like you said, Julian, we went and soil tested in those sort of three zones, um, top of the hill down to the bottom. Um, I think you mentioned that, yeah, the, the, the soil depth uh, changes and the, and the water holding capacity changes. And what was the what was the nutrient that was lacking? Was it sulfur or potassium? I can't remember now. Uh, a lot of potassium. Yeah, because pota potassium is big in your cropping system, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 70 or 80 years of peanuts and a lot of peanut hay baled over the years. Yeah, huge, huge potassium removal. And I think, of course, the red soils too, I think, um, are a lot lower naturally in potassium compared to the black soils. You know, we sort of don't see it running out, whereas um, in, the, in the more well-drained um, soils in the red country, you, you generally, yeah, and you're taking a lot of uh, material away, has, and you, you've definitely got uh, less, less potassium in those areas that have taken more away. So we identified a potassium deficiency, didn't we? Uh, Christian, yeah, you got a question? Yeah, I was just wondering those summer and winter stacks, was it of a number of different actual winter crops? So you might have had, yeah, you know, they weren't just all the same crop that you stacked on top of each other. Uh, I can't uh, same remember. Same period of time, obviously, but different. The, the, majority, 
the majority would have been weak. Yeah. Yep. You also see that, um, funny as it sounds, in mung beans too. Um, this year was a classic example with the real dry year, the, the heavier country there, um, that shallower country that tends to run out. Like if I had, had had maize there, it would have dropped dead, whereas the mung beans were by far the best there in the, in the better, deeper country. They, they fail to perform. It's just, and you, and you see, I've seen that a few times. Funny, mm. little plant, funny little plant they are. Mm. Well, we've seen the same with canola and barley down south where the zones are right, but they're completely opposite. The, the best canola grows on the worst barley ground and vice versa. So what you're saying is exactly, exactly the same. In that, when we did the variable rates there, we applied, we applied the, um, the potash and the DAP, the phosphorus, uh, pre-plant deep rip with the strip till. And when we did it, we heavily applied the poor areas to try and boost them up and, and backed off in the, in the better country where the requirement wasn't there, obviously. And in the end, we used pretty much the same amount of fur as we would have with a blanket coverage. And when we come to do the nitrogen application for the corn plant, well, as I said earlier, we had excess nitrogen in those poor red areas um, and in the blue areas, yeah, bumped up to a couple of hundred kilos per hectare of urea and end up across the 33 hectares used 1.5 tonne less, which, which were opened my eyes a bit too. And we could have used more because I think the, the site said, don't put any on the red areas, but I couldn't bring myself to do that. We had to actually put a bit on. Yeah. So, but that's what we did. And I think uh, your agronomist, uh, Ben, worked out the potential yield jump for that was fairly considerable um, from memory. I can't remember what the exact numbers were now. No, but it certainly, it, it reflected through on the harvest data. We had that we had that harvest data up perfectly yesterday, Tim, when I sent that through to you. And um, yeah, the system got a glitch in it. You got half of that and, and mine <laughs> completely gone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, well, I'll jump across to that now. Um, so there's the, I put a uh, March corn image up there and well, half the yield map. Yeah, well, I had the whole thing yesterday and it, it did, re it reflected it perfectly to those earlier images. It was spot on the money. Mm. Yep. It was a huge variance, like down from a tonne to the hectare in the really poor areas, I think it peaked at about seven on the monitor, but yeah, five and five point eight or something. The field averaged just over four ton. Yeah, right. From one from one to seven. Yeah, that's good for for a dry, a pretty bloody average summer, wasn't it? Yeah, luckily it was a late twentieth or eighteenth of January, I think, plant, and um, good deep country there, and a lot of it, and it hung through till the March rain rescued it, and. Yeah, it, um, it actually ended up pretty good, considering. So what's what was, I guess, um, what's some of your major challenges? You probably already touched on some of the year monitoring, but tell us about how, you, some of your realisations about how sort of simple it was once you understood the process to get, you know, a file into a machine and, and, it's, and all of a sudden it's working. Oh, that was extraordinary, yeah. Extraordinary simple. Um, Tim set out the variable rate map, sent it across to me by email, put it on the USB stick and put it in the top con and set it and went to work. It was extraordinary. Um, that probably in hindsight should have been doing it sooner, knowing how simple it is here. Bit, bit, bit hesitant with the new technology and, oh uh, yeah, but no, it was surprisingly simple. Thank you, Tim. Mm, yeah, well, I think that's that's a great message because uh, we, you know until we until things become clear in the process, you, you think it's it's too hard. But once you do it once, it's like oh well, that's not as hard as I thought. So, and I think that's a fault of the technology companies in the past is we haven't built technology that's been simple. If you buy a phone now, everything works and simple because it's a you know it's a commercial uh, you know 
a large number of people use it, but in agriculture, we haven't had the number of users to build that really simplistic software, I think. And that's where we, as, a, as an industry, we fail. Uh, things are improving rapidly now, but there's still a long way to go, I think. Um, and we, we've got to get that message out though, that it's, it's really not as hard as you think. And, and, and to get at least started in the process, you don't have to be perfect first go, it's just about getting started and learning, I think is a key, key message. One of the big messages to me out of this experiment last year was uh, the, the variable, the, the, the potash, the phosphorus, not so, the nitrogen. I couldn't believe the, 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 the variance in the nitrogen requirement that, and with the price of it now and with the reef management coming in this side of the, the rains that we're in, um, yeah, extremely important and straight out waste of money too, just quietly. Mm. Yeah, exactly. One and a half tons in a paddock. Might, yeah, might only seem trivial, but now the price is up near a thousand. Um, it gets very, very uh, costly over a, a large number of paddocks. Well, exactly. Fifteen hundred bucks on thirty-three hectares. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, any questions? Please feel free to throw them up to the chat at the QA. Um, Julian would love to answer those questions. So. Yeah, flick, flick them through. Um, is there anything else that we we should cover off on, mate? Um, if we go back a few years, um, 2012, 13, I think, we did a lot of work with the uh, satellite imagery with Dr. Andrew Robson with the peanuts. And um, he had the yield, the yield down pretty pretty well on, on the peanuts just with the, the imagery. And um, the other important thing we noticed with that imagery at the time, with the variable soil depths and types, is in the dry seasons, aflatoxin becomes a big issue in peanuts. And we were finding that the imagery, the variable, the vari variations across the paddock, a couple of times, a couple of harvests, we actually dug sections of the, of the field early before the aflatoxin set in because they were crashing due to lack of moisture. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose that was, that, was our, that was our early steps into the variance of, you know, actually seeing firsthand the variance across the field. Probably should have kept it up, but Andrew went and left. He did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think he also predicted uh, with some different spectrum, we're even detecting aflatoxin disease. So there's a great opportunity going forward with the ad advancements in satellite data to actually have more light spectrums, which can pick up specific problems. So his research showed that just a couple of light spectrums could actually detect aflatoxin disease in peanuts. And I think if, if we think about the range of crops we've got and the biggest diseases, we'll get to the point where we'll be able to predict disease very, very very, very accurately uh, from satellite data. So that, that'll be a handy tool as we as we build more research in this area uh, and, the, and the satellites become available. If I follow on with that, actually, Julian, the, there's, there's actually about 7,000 satellites up in space at the moment. And But last year alone, there was a 25% increase in that number. So it shows you that the space race is very much on. And the quality and the repeatness, the repeat, repeatability and the cost is going to get better and better and better as we go. Um, we're also working on some products that will, will penetrate through cloud because cloud's obviously a, a major problem with this sort of satellite data. So, you know, there's, there's, there's more and more options coming there as, as well. So this whole space is moving very quickly. Any any questions? Any more comments? Christian, did you have any more questions of Julian? No, I don't think so, mate. That was really good. Um, just getting some insight, I suppose, into a different crop too, different cropping system. We don't often hear much about peanuts and, and what have you. So no, it's very interesting. Cool. Well, thanks, Julian, for sharing your um, your actual experiences and uh, letting the world know what, what some of the challenges are. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm just gonna finish quickly with 
um, a quick demo of the, the data farming platform. If you do just want to get started, if you've got you know, no yield maps at the moment and you're not sure where to go, there's, you know, there's a really simple tool we've built just to get started on, um, on, on this whole journey. If you want to, want to do that, uh, let me just share my screen. Any, so you can, you can access this for any, any internet connection. So on your phone, on your tablet, or on, on a computer, you can log in directly through maps.datafarming. When you arrive for the first time, all we ask is, a, is an email and a password. You create your own password, and then you can come back and, and re-log in. When you log in, you can add a farm. And um, I'll just use Julian's example again here, mate. Um, you can add a farm. Once you've got that in there, you can start drawing paddocks or you can even upload fields um, from, say, Ag World or Back Paddock or if you've got it already drawn in Google, Google Earth, you can just bring that straight in. Um, let's just go and view this. So once you, once you come in and your paddocks are loaded and, and drawn, or you can just draw them very simply with a simple drawing tool there, as soon as you click on a field, all of the available images come up. And like I said, for every farm in the world, there's an image every five days for the last five years. So there's stacks of data to go through. Um, and you can see here that, well, actually, Julian, there should be, according to this, there should be another image uh, today. And the satellite would have went over at 10.30. So I reckon in about an hour's time, there's probably going to be an image appear over your, over that, over that block. So it's pretty quick to come in. It's amazing how, yeah, you know, not, not only about three or four years ago, we'd probably wait, to, we'd wait for, for days and days to get an image to come in, but now it's sort of hours. So it's really exciting how things have changed. Um, oh, there's probably nothing growing in there right now. That's, that was silly. Um, but weeds. Weeds, yeah. Well, um, oh, there's still a bit of, still a little bit of uh, vegetation showing up. So anything over... Anything blue and green there is is still a little bit of vegetation left. It could be the corn still hanging on a bit too, mate. Could it? Ah, uh, no, I actually sprayed it out about ten days ago. It had a good crop of radish, and from that July rain, the winter rain we had had a hell of a good crop of radish and spiny emix and stuff in there. So it's in the process of dying now. Dying, right? Eh? Yep. So that that sort of tells you that there's still some veg there. It's it's dying off. Um, the end of your that, that brown area through go. I was say that brown area through the middle there is yep. uh, reasonably clean. There wasn't much weed there. Okay. So you could you could actually let's just go back and you could create a a variable spraying map on that if you wanted to. Um, yeah. Let let me show you what you can do. You could just um, you could just convert that into a zone map. Just clicking zone on the right hand side there. You could up you could up the water rate or you know the the volume going out if you just got no if you if you're not direct injection you're just increasing the water water rate aren't you with the chemical in it so it's um, that's about the best you can do but say you are using some some uh, you know more expensive products you could be just give it a second and it'll convert that. So that's that's that. Oops, I'll shift that over this side. You can see. So that's that image on that day, and we just split that up into three zones. So what you're saying, June, this brown area here, that you know really was pretty well clean, and these other areas. So we could have actually said, um, well, let's put uh, 40 liters on here, and 60 liters of product on here, and 100 liter of product on here, for example. Um, yep. So you could actually do that, and 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 for we just charge us uh, sort of forty cents a hectare rate um, per hectare. So for thirteen bucks, you could have got a file that could have gone into a spray rig if you had barrel break control in your spray rig, for example. I'm just going off. <laughs> I'm just winging it here, mate. But um, yeah, that's the sort of that's how quick it could be. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there any questions on that at all? Um, I guess you, you've got to be careful of cloud as any other thing. So let's just have a look here. You've got lots of dry weather at the moment, so there's plenty of cloud-free images. 
So that one had said it had 2% cloud, but it's not over that paddock. Here's one that's 49%. You just click on that cloud button there. And yes, there's cloud all over it. So you wouldn't use that image at all on that day. Um, the red is where it's automatically detecting cloud. So you just got to ignore that. Um, the other little thing we've got is a NDVI-R, which is a regional wide NDVI. So you can see, go and check on your neighbors. You can have a look on, on what crops are growing through the district. Um, so the greener it is, the, the better the crop. Um, yeah, just another little feature you can, you can have a look around. Now, is there any questions at all on anything we've covered today?